Welcome, this is a short video on flow control in computer programming. One of the most basic elements of programming is the ability to control the order in which instructions are executed, how many times they're executed, or even if they are executed at all. There are several different types of flow control that are commonly used. Uh, conditional execution, also known as if-then statements. Iteration, also known as loops, and we're going to look at four for each and while loops. And finally, structured exception or error handling, which we'll mention in this video, but which is worthy of an entire video of its own, which we'll do separately. In the case of conditional execution, uh, we have structures such as if-then statements or switch case statements, uh, and they basically boil down to whether or not an expression uh, is true or false. Let's take a look at conditional expressions. Conditional expressions are expressions that evaluate to true or false. Values that are generally evaluated as quote-unquote true are the actual Boolean literal true, non-zero numeric values, non-empty strings, and non-empty arrays. Values that generally are evaluated as false are the Boolean literal false, a zero, an empty string, an empty array, or the values null, nil, or undefined, which exist in various different programming languages. Let's take a look at some code examples of if-then statements. Starting with JavaScript, Java, and R, which all have very similar structures for if-then statements. Um, on the left, we'll take a look. Uh, a typical if-then statement is the word if, followed by a conditional expression in parentheses. If the expression is true, then the code inside of the curly braces, where it says do this, will be executed. Slightly more um, advanced is the if else statement. So if the conditional expression is true, it does the code in the first block. Otherwise, it will execute the code in the second block. Uh, and you can string together multiple conditional expressions by uh, using the else if pattern. So if uh, some expression, do this. Otherwise, if second expression, another conditional, do this. Otherwise, do some default action. We also can use uh, what's called a switch case statement, and this is based on comparing the value of a variable to the multiple alternative values it might have. So in this case, we've got var1, or variable 1, uh, which is the control variable for our switch case statement. And then if it is the case that it equals value 1, then you'll do the code in the first block. If it is equal to value 2 or value 3, it'll do the execute the code in the second block. And if it's not equal to any of those values, then it will execute the call code in the default block. And this is more or less equivalent to the if, else, if, else statement directly below it. If then statements are almost exactly the same in PHP. Uh, in Go, again, they're almost exactly the same, except there are no parentheses around uh, the conditional expressions. Python uses indentation uh, to format its if then statements. Uh, and Python does not have a switch case statement, so uh, you would have to use the if, else if, uh, else pattern, which is at the bottom of the left-hand example. Ruby uh, has a sy syntax that's pretty similar to, uh, to Python, but Ruby has some additional uh, conditional structures, like unless, uh, and unless is means pretty much what the word in English means. So if says if this is true, uh, and unless means unless this is true, then do this, right? So it's basically the inverse of the if statement. Uh, there is a case statement in Ruby, which is uh, shown on the right. Okay, so moving on from if then statements, we're gonna look at iteration with loops. Computers are really, really good at repeating things over and over. They don't get tired, they don't complain, uh, they don't lose focus. 
In general, iterative structures are called loops, and there are several different kinds of loops. And we're going to look at for loops, uh, while or until loops, or do while or do until loops, for each loops, which also take the form of for in statements or for of statements. And we're also going to look at uh, the functional style of a loop, even though uh, technically it's not really a loop. Uh, the key idea here is that every loop must have a terminal condition, uh, and there can be both normal termination of a loop when it gets to the end of whatever process, or early termination where uh, maybe circumstances uh, indicate that you should just uh, stop iterating and go on with the, the next step in your program, maybe because of an error or because of some other condition that was reached. There are many, many different kinds of loops used in various programming languages, more than we can cover in a short video like this. Uh, so the key warning here is just to make sure that you do your homework and study up on all of the different kinds of loops available in each new language that you work with. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of examples of loops. Here is the sort of traditional uh, C style for loop, uh, C style meaning uh, it originated with the programming language C, uh, C++, Java, JavaScript, PHP, pretty much all of those language implement some uh, form of this kind of loop. The example here is in JavaScript, but you can see here uh, you have the word for, and then in parentheses you have three statements that are separated by semicolons. The first statement uh, is initialization code. Typically here uh, that means setting a value, like uh, if you look at the example, uh, taking a variable i and setting its value to zero. The second expression is the end condition, and this is how the loop decides when to terminate. Uh, in the example below, it says, uh, do this while i is less than 10. Right? So it checks to see that i is less than 10. If that's true, it continues the loop. If it's false, then it terminates the loop. And then finally, the third expression is the incrementer uh, or decrementer, and this is where you change typically the variable that you initialized in the initialization step uh, so that uh, there will eventually be a time when the loop terminates. Um, so looking again at this example, we say for i equals zero, so we set initialize i equal to zero, uh, and then if i is less than 10, which it is, um, do the thing inside of the loop, and at the end of that, we're going to increment by adding 1 to i. So i plus equals 1 adds 1 to i, so i becomes 1. We check to see that it's less than 10, which it is, and it does the thing inside the loop. And then it increments i again, now i is 2. Checks to see that it's less than 10, it is, and so it'll do the thing inside of the loop. Uh, and it'll keep doing this until i equals 10, in which case it's no longer less than 10, and the loop ends and it moves on to the next line of expression. As you can see here, Java, JavaScript, PHP, Go, all use this general structure for their for loops. There is a variation on the for loop called the for each loop. Um, and this is used for iterating over collections. So uh, we, have a we have a separate video on collections, but uh, collections are things like arrays, vectors, objects. Um, these are you know, dictionaries. These are things that have a collection of items. And uh, sometimes you want to do the same thing to every element in your array or every element in your collection. And so you can see here um, examples of for each loops in PHP, Ruby, Python, and JavaScript. Uh, so in PHP for each, we have a collection called items. And for each one, the key is going to be either the array index or the, the property name, uh, if it's an object, and then the variable item will be set to the value of that item. Uh, and you can loop over each one of those and do something with it. In this case, we're just outputting that. Uh, and you can see here that uh, echoing item and echoing items with the key uh, as the array key will, th these two lines of code do essentially the same thing. And in Ru Ruby, we have the collection items 
and items.each do, and then uh, in between pipe characters, uh, the value, value item um, allows us to output each item in the items collection. Um, Python, this does essentially the same thing. Uh, in JavaScript, we have for var i in items, for this structure, for, for i in, the i is actually set to the index of uh, each successive index of that collection. So if it's an array, it starts at 0, 1, 2, 3, going through every index in the array. Alternatively, in JavaScript, there is a for of loop, right? So for item of items, it's going to go through and uh, set the value of item equal to each successive item in that items collection. Um, and those two loops, the above loop, the for in loop, and the for of loop, those do the same thing in JavaScript, just different ways of expressing it. There are other kinds of for loops. Uh, they generally include some sort of counter variable um, and some range to be traversed or counted. So in Python, for i in range uh, would iterate over the values 1 through 5, and you know, i would be equal to those values. Uh, for Ruby has a similar uh, structure for i in 1 dot dot 5 is the range 1 to 5, or 5 dot times does something five times, and in this case, uh, i starts at zero and goes to four, but a total of five iterations. Um, and then there's one dot up to five, right? That would do the same thing as for i in one dot dot five. Uh, and you've got down to and some other um, forms of those types of loops in Ruby. R has a similar uh, for i in one colon five iterates over the values from one to five. So um, essentially, the the common denominator of all of these things is that there is a counter variable uh, and some range to be traversed or counted, and you can do something on each iteration. So we have while or do while loops. Um, the only requirement here is that you have to specify a terminating condition, right? So as opposed to the for loop where we have initializer, terminating condition, and some sort of incrementer, with a while loop all we have is the terminal condition. So um, we sort of cheated on the left hand side because we have an initializer i equals zero that uh, happens before the loop uh, starts and then you know, we're going to do something and the incrementer is actually inside the loop. But eventually, uh, following this, I will be, you know, equal to some value that is 10 or greater, and I will no longer be less than 10, and therefore the loop will terminate. Um, there is a slight difference between the left and the right. So a do while loop is a loop that always um, executes at least one time. Right, so um, even if I started as 10, which is obviously not less than 10, this do while loop would execute uh, at least once, right? And that is useful in some circumstances. Okay, and so finally we're going to look at what are um, what I'm calling functional style loops, and I put loops in uh, quotes because um, the key thing about the functional functional style loop is um, whereas in you know, for loops and while loops, um, we t tend to care about the order in which things are executed. In functional functional style loops, we don't care about the order in which uh, these things can happen, and they could even all happen simultaneously for all we care. Um, the only thing that we're really concerned about is that the same transformation is applied to each element in the collection that's being uh, traversed or looped over. So in JavaScript, there is a function called map, which applies a function to all the elements of an array. Um, so I've got a function called cm to n, which converts uh, a centimeter value to an inches value. Then I have a variable C, CMs, CMS, which is an array of uh, numeric values, which are presumably uh, centimeters. And then uh, we have a variable INS, which is short for inches, um, which is going to be set equal to CMS dot map CM to N. So what that does is it applies our centimeter to inch conversion function to each element 
of our centimeters array. And the output, again, would be, uh, as displayed in the comment below, um, it would multiply 0 0.3937 times each of those values in the CM's array and add that to uh, an array for the output, right? Um, so just to re reiterate, we don't care about what order in which the computer does those transformations. We just want to make sure that every transformation gets done. Um, this is the sort of default, the standard approach to doing uh, array transformations in R. And so we have a similar example here um, where we create a vector um, of values 10, 15, 20, which we assign to the variable CMS or centimeters. And then we use the S apply function to apply a function which multiplies a value times 0 0.3937 to all of the elements of the CMS array or vector. And the output uh, is shown below. It is pretty much the same as we had in the JavaScript example. All right, so what are the, some of the pitfalls uh, that you might encounter while using loops? Uh, the most classic one is the off by one error. Uh, and so here's an example of this below. Well, i equals zero while i is less than or equal to five. i plus equals one. Um, some people will do this thinking that this will um, give you values between like zero and five or one and five. Um, it actually outputs uh, the value six times. Um, that may be what you were trying to do, um, but it might not have been. So, uh, you know, maybe you were looking for an iteration of five times. Um, this is a situation that comes up extremely frequently. Uh, there's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to off by one errors. Uh, the other pitfall is the failure to terminate, also known as an infinite loop. Uh, so here's an example where we start uh, uh, with the initializer i equals 1 and every time we go through the loop we're uh, incrementing i by 2 so i plus equals 2 so i will be 1 then it will be 3 then it will be 5 then 7 then 9 etc etc counting up the odd numbers uh, and the terminating condition is um, or this is why while i is not equal to 10 right is the terminating condition well as we um, look at this i will never be equal to 10 right and so it will continually um, execute the content inside of the loop an infinite number of times uh, in the history of history, this could crash your computer. Uh, nowadays, we are sm our computers are smart enough to look out for situations like this, uh, so you're not likely to you know, crash your computer, although obviously your program won't work as you expect if you have an infinite loop. And lots of compilers and in interpreters can catch when you are you know, setting up an infinite loop, so be careful about that. All right, the final type of flow control is what's known as exception handling. Uh, an exception is when something goes wrong at runtime and it's usually caused by something outside of the programmer's control. For example, uh, there was no network connection available or the user of your program entered some input that was not uh, conformant to the, you know, format that was expected. Um, but it's possible to plan for those situations and we're going to have a whole other video on exceptions. But here is an example. Typically, um, JavaScript, uh, Java, PHP use this try catch uh, structure. So uh, within the curly braces after the try statement, you're going to do something risky that otherwise it might cause an error at runtime. Uh, if it does occur, then the flow control is passed to the catch expression. Uh, and usually passes along some sort of error variable or error object uh, and you can handle that situation maybe you can give the user another chance to do the thing that they did wrong or uh, otherwise you know end gracefully instead of having you know the computer come to a crashing halt uh, as a result of an error in the program all right in summary uh, controlling the flow of your code is a fundamental skill when writing programs uh, conditional expression, also known as if then, and iteration loops are the primary means of accomplishing this. Uh, exception handling is a third model for handling flow control, and it's so important we're going to handle it in another video.